Okay, so welcome to this eighth video on skeletal muscle contraction. And this video, what we're going to do is discuss how, now you've contracted the muscle, how do you actually relax it again? And the first thing we need to discuss is how you terminate the signal from, coming from the neuron. So, long, long ago, I drew this picture of an axon terminal synapsing with the myofiber and releasing acetylcholine onto it. Basically, what you need to do is somehow terminate that acetylcholine signal. And basically, once the neuron stops firing, the acetylcholine needs to be removed from the synaptic cleft. And the way in which that is done is that you have enzymes. And there are enzymes in this synaptic cleft. So in the synaptic cleft, there are also enzymes. So I'll draw this enzyme here which break down acetylcholine and the enzyme which breaks down acetylcholine is known as acetylcholinesterase so acetylcholinesterase okay so these enzymes are in the synaptic cleft and what they will do is they'll break down the acetylcholine and the way they break it down is they break this ester link so they hydrolyze this ester link and basically what will happen is they'll break this bond here and they'll take a water molecule, so let's say we've got a water molecule over here, and they'll break the, one of the bonds of the water molecule, they'll attach the hydroxyl group from the water molecule onto this carbon here, and they'll attach the hydrogen onto this oxygen to make acetic acid here and choline here. So this is choline, the molecule choline. And this molecule over here will be acetic acid or acetate. Acetic acid. Right. So, acetic acid and choline are not active at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So, once you've broken down all the acetylcholine to acetic acid and choline, the signal, the stimulation of the myofiber will stop. So, what acetylcholinesterase is ensure is that you only stimulate the myofiber for a little while whilst the acetylcholine nesterases haven't had time to break down all the acetylcholine that has been released by this axon terminal. Okay, so there how you, uh, you stop, um, you terminate the signal from the neuron. Now, when you terminate the signal from the neuron, what's going to happen is, moving on a bit, uh, you're going to stop releasing uh, calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the dihydropyridine receptors will stop being activated because once the neuron stops stimulating the sarcolemma, you're no longer going to get action potentials propagating along the sarcolemma. So the dihydropyridine receptor will become inactive. That will lead the reanidine receptor type 1 to become inactive and you'll stop releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, there is a pump basically, in the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which will um, return the calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this pump is known as the circa for sarco-slash-endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. Sarco-slash-endoplasmic uh, reticulum calcium ATPase. Reticulum... Uh, calcium ATPase. And basically this pump moves two calcium ions into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So I'll draw it here. It's going to move two calcium ions into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum like so. And in exchange it will move three protons back out of the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm and it will also hydrolyze ATP in this process. So a single molecule of ATP will come in and be hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. Okay, right. So uh, we'll now just quickly go over how the sarcoplasm-endoplasmic sarco reticulum works. But before doing that, let's just look at the bigger picture. What this is going to do is it's going to take calcium levels in the cytoplasm down. If calcium goes down in the cytoplasm, then calcium is going to cleave off from troponin C. If calcium cleaves off from troponin C, then tropomyosin is going to return to its original conformation, and it will block the um, actin uh, monomer myosin binding sites. So the myosin filament will no longer be able to climb up the actin filament. 
So you will block uh, these cross bridge formation. And when all the cross bridges have cleaved, basically, because the tropomyosin is uh, breaking the myosin heads away because it's covering up the myosin binding sites, then basically what will happen is that the elastic recoil will re-extend the sarcomeres back out, basically. And that will lead to the relaxation of the muscle. Okay, so let's just have a quick revision of how this uh, circa pump works. Okay, so initially, the initial conformation I'm going to talk about is the conformation where you have start off, if we draw the circa here, you start off with free protons attached to the uh, cytosolic portion of circa. So here is circa, here, and basically at the moment, it's in the conformation where the ion binding sites are facing the cytoplasm rather than the ER lumen or the sarcoplasm since we're talking about skeletal muscles. So here's the SR lumen, I suppose I should say. SR lumen, right. Okay, so these protons that are facing the cytoplasm, they are going to, um, they are going to have their positions stolen, basically. So... Uh, this this conformation of circa is known as the E1 conformation. And basically, E1 means that circa has its ion binding sites facing the cytoplasm rather than the ER lumen. Now, when it is in the E1 conformation, i.e. the ionic binding sites are facing the cytoplasm, these ion binding sites don't like having hydrogen ions bound to them, basically. They prefer having calcium ions bound to them. So, what's going to happen is that calcium is going to displace these um, free protons from the circa. So, what's going to happen is, if we draw the next stage, here is our circa protein. And the protons have been displaced by two calcium ions. So, uh, whereas three protons could bind to these binding sites, uh, only two calcium ions can fit in, basically. So, here we have two calcium ions in this binding site. And now, because the ionic binding sites are still facing uh, the cytoplasm rather than uh, the lumen of the ER, uh, this is still known as the E1 conformation, but now it's E1 with two calciums bound to it. Okay, now the next phase is that ATP has to come in and bind to, um, to this protein. So in comes ATP, and it is going to bind to the cytosolic uh, domain of, um, of the circa protein. So here is circa. It's still got two calcium ions facing the cytoplasm here. And here is our ATP bound here. Right. What happens next is that this ATP molecule is hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate. And the phosphate group remains bound to an aspartate residue on the circa protein. Okay. So this conformation where it transiently has ATP bound to it is known as the E1 because you've still got the ionic binding sites closer to the cytoplasm than the ER lumen. Then it's ATP because it's got ATP bound to it. And then it's 2 calcium 2 plus because there are 2 calcium ions bound to it. Okay, and now what's going to happen is this ATP is going to be hydrolyzed. So here we go. Here is the, um, the phospholipid bi there of the endoplasmic reticulum. Here is the um, circa protein here. Now ATP has been hydrolyzed and all you've got left is a phosphate group. Then you've got two calcium ions bound here. Okay, so these are calcium ions here. Right, so this is now known as the E1 with a phosphate group and two calcium ions conformation. Okay, so it's E1 because the ionic binding site at the moment is still uh, closer to the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm than it is to the ER lumen. Uh, and it's got a phosphate group on, which is what this P denotes. And then the two calcium 2 plus denotes that it's got two calcium ions bound to it. Okay, so now what happens is that the phosphate group being bound to this aspartate residue, so this is an aspartate residue that it's actually bound to, um, changes the conformation of the protein. And basically, the ligand binding sites, these sites which have bound these calcium ions, are going to 
totally move. They're going to move downwards and they're going to now be closer to the uh, ER lumen than they are to the cytoplasm. Okay, and when circa is in a conformation where these ligand binding sites are closer to the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum than to the cytoplasm, then it's known as being in the E2 conformation. So here are our two calciums now held closer to uh, the um, endoplasmic reticulum lumen side than to uh, the cytoplasmic side. Okay, so we are now in the E2 conformation. We have phosphate group, uh, and then we have uh, two calciums still bound. Okay, so it's gone from this to this. Now, when it is in the E2 um, conformation, these ligand binding sites, or these ionic binding sites, no longer like calcium. They'd actually much prefer to have protons bound to them now. So, what's going to happen is that free protons are going to come in and displace these two calciums. So, it's going to go like this. Um, the calciums are going to be released from the E2 conformation of this circa protein. Uh, the phosphate group is still at the moment bound. The phosphate group, remember, is what is holding it in this E2 conformation. But the ligand binding, um, binding domains now prefer to have protons bound to them than calcium. So the protons are displacing the calcium. And free protons come in and replace the two calcium ions. So the calcium now goes off into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen. Okay. Now, when there are protons bound in these ligand binding sites, the phosphate group doesn't actually like that. So the phosphate group breaks off. But when the phosphate group breaks off, it means that the um, protein changes back to its E1 conformation. So it now changes back to its E1 conformation. The phosphate group has broken off. And there are three protons now facing the cytoplasm. And it's in its E1 conformation now. And when it's in its E1 conformation, it doesn't actually like having protons bound to it. It prefers having calcium bound to it. And we're back to the beginning phase, basically. Okay, so that is how the circa pump actually exchanges uh, free protons from the ER lumen for two calciums coming into the ER lumen. And how ATP being hydrolyzed to ADP and inorganic phosphate is involved in that process. So overall, this pump moves sodium in uh, sorry it moves calcium into the ER and moves protons out of the ER uh, so it's um, it, it's going to uh, reduce calcium concentrations in the sarcoplasm and that leads to um, relaxation of the skeletal muscle